sponsors. We love Famous Monsters magazines because it takes you behind the scenes, not only to how the movies are made, but how the monsters are made. And we found out through reading Famous Monsters that monsters are made by makeup artists, incredible artists like Jack Pierce, who took the time, hours and hours, to make Boris Karloff into Frankenstein. And if you guys don't know Boris Karloff, if you guys don't know Frankenstein, like, it's a Famous Monsters panel, you guys know who Boris Karloff is. Creators and uh, both Anna and I work in different facets of effects, but we have gotten to know other people. I've actually worked with another amazing effect artist, Walter Welsh. Uh, Walter, you and I worked together on Grimm, and I remember walking in one Saturday morning, and there were two dead bodies, which is impressive. It was probably like 10 on a Saturday. The bodies were burnt to a crisp. This is Saturday morning, okay? I don't know when this guy sleeps. Uh, do we have any face-off fans in the house? <laughs> Walter has been on a previous season of face-off, and he's also on the, the um, All-Star all final season right now, right? Um, Walter, say hello to, to 60 Years of Famous Monsters. No Comic-Con. Walter has done some super, super cool stuff. Um, especially since I last saw him. Walter, you're on Face Off now, you're doing some fun stuff, but before I want to go that, let's go back out of time. What is one of your favorite monsters growing up? Uh, for me, it's Predator. Uh, I've never heard such like a flat Predator. Predator. It's a uh, Predator. Predator. I'm so excited. You like the original Predator design, Stan Winston, James Cameron threw a quick, if you guys know about that story, James Cameron threw a quick design note in there. Famous Monsters actually had an exclusive cover for Predator, it was issue number 251. Predator is one of my favorites as well. Well, you're doing a lot of stuff this weekend, you're going to do some demos here at Comic-Con, right? Oh yeah, we're doing a big Thanos demo for, uh, from Infinity War tomorrow at 12 o'clock at the Famous Monsters booth. Now, if you guys haven't seen magic before, Walt will show you. Walt, can you tell us real quick, for something like this, what goes into a makeup like this? Uh, the, well, we're, I'm trying to change the anatomy to make the actor or model larger than life. So uh, my friend who's going to be Thanos, he's about 6'3". We're making him 6'7", 6'8". We're broadening his shoulders, changing his facial features trying to make it look like Josh Brolin from the Infinity War movie as much as we possibly could, and then kind of like tie into the comics and sideshow collectibles as well. And when you're going to do this makeup tomorrow, from the time you sit your large buddy down in that chair, <laughs> to the time that he walks away ready to snap half of this Comic-Con gun, snap how, long, how long is that going to take? Uh, well, it's all pre-painted, so it's only going to be about two hours, and I really want him to be able to walk around and interact with people and kind of draw attention to the booth. Now, just so you know, this is how makeup artists think of stuff. He just said it's already pre-painted, and it's only going to take two hours. Only two hours of doing makeup on someone's face. Think about what that's like, right? Um, and then, like Aaron mentioned before, there's going to be a really killer Infinity Gauntlet raffle held at Famous Monsters booth. It's 1314. Saturday the drawing is at 6.30 p.m. and Sunday the drawing is at 4.30 p.m. Make sure you guys are there. The value at $100, it's articulated, you pull D-rings, it moves, makes sounds, That's lights true. up, it's that. life size, it's, it's giant, it's the coolest toy ever made. Now, Walter, I know you're not allowed to spoil anything, so we're going to set up a little communication thing. Just blink or like breathe normal if you win. No, no, you guys will have to watch to find out. Watch him on Face Off, guys. Walter Wells, everybody. Thank you. So, Matt, when we got to interview Mark Mixon for the Launchpad podcast, we found out that his biggest inspiration for getting into makeup was a famous monster magazine, issue 105, that features the Rick Baker Monster Maker, that's a mouthful, features that article that showed behind the scenes and it made him want to create makeup. And he went on to create the original Pennywise the Clown. So that goes to show how one issue of Famous Monsters can take you from being a fan to being a creator. And so that transitions really well into the big issue, the one that matters most all year. We're gonna talk about the Famous Monsters Annual. So, to start with it, the Famous Monster Annual comes out every year, and one of the best parts about Famous Monster magazines are the covers. 
The covers are so cool because they were created, some of the original ones are so iconic, created by Basil Gogos. We should give it up for Basil Gogos. This guy made it. <laughs> On the PowerPoint, you can see the, uh, the first cover reveal. It's going to be Frankenstein and his bride. That artist on that is Sam Julian. Aww. Actually, one of the original Famous Monsters cover artists, along the, the same time when Basil Logos was doing covers. And uh, yeah, we have uh, we had this Frankenstein cover because, as everyone here probably knows, it's the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein. It's so we're going to have a lot of coverage uh, about Frankenstein. We've got we've got an unpublished article from Forey that was written on spec for the LA Times that never saw publication in the magazine. We've got um, you know the curator of a Frankenstein art show. We've got a lot of cool stuff. People coming at Frankenstein from different angles, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and also, well, as you can read up here, <laughs> the thing is, um, now that we've gone annual, we're trying to make this a real collectible. So we're focusing on anniversaries mainly. And another, one, another big one this year is uh, 50 Years of Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> and we're gonna teach, we're, uh, we have spoken to John Russo and Russ Streiner, both of whom were involved in the making of uh, Night of the Living Dead. Um, and uh, we've got uh, the, original, the original creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, an interview with him, Rico Browning. He played the creature underneath when he was swimming underwater. And we're also going to be talking to uh, Mike Ferris and the creature actor Duck Jones, who is sort of the modern incarnation of that. Also, 25 years of Jurassic Park and the history of dinosaurs on the film. And the next cover we've got 85 years of Kong. King Kong, everyone. This is also a San Julian. And I don't know. You know, perceptive people can, can figure out that this is actually the 70s King Kong because he's on top of the Twin Towers. Yeah. And the Jets. This girl, this girl knows her stuff. If you don't know Holly Interlandy, she is the editor of Famous Monsters of Film, which is a thankless but super hard job. <laughs> okay, so moving on to anniversaries, we've also got 50 years of Planet of the Apes. <laughs> A bunch of fun interviews with Grindhouse directors from the 80s. We also have an anniversary celebrations of Child's Play. They live, Dark City, Piranha, all sorts of great stuff. You know, third, lots of anniversaries this year. So, and that brings us to um, we also have some comic books that we're going to be previewing in the annual. Um, one of which is the winner of the best graphic novel story. For in the Silver Screen Festival, which is a, a film festival that Famous Monsters puts on every year. This year was the third annual Silver Screen Festival. And the, the, the winner of the best... One more, one more. There yeah. we go. The winner of the best graphic story this year was Dennis St. John, I believe he's actually here. Hey. He's looking at this fantastic, whimsical black and white short story about Two friends were drinking in the woods and they throw a can at a homeless man who ends up maybe not being a homeless man. <laughs> Real quick, what exactly is Silver Scream? Silver Scream is Famous Monsters Film Festival, yearly film festival. Phil, do you want, do you want, to, do you want to talk about that? Oh yeah, um, so it's a, um, it's a horror film festival. Um, it was to um, uh, bring the community together in Northern California. And, this last year we had a fundraiser for the wildfire that had happened and so it's a it's a pretty pretty amazing show and um, you know we get people from all across the country and so we're really proud of it. And we also accept graphic novel submissions as you can Oh that's right, sorry. Yeah. So this is the winner of the best graphic short story. There's a little tease here. What you can expect. We also have a graphic novel script competition which uh, in 2017 was won by writer Matt Draymond, who wrote a script called Black Sunday, which I say it puts the Gothic into American Gothic. American Gothic Press is the, public, the famous monsters publisher of comic books. And uh, Black Sunday was really unique, and it's dark, and it's, it's a ghost story about the Great Depression and farmers in the Great Depression, and how, you know, 
ordinary things can, can manifest themselves into seemingly horrifying, like ghosts and monsters and stuff. And yes, there will be monsters. This is a preview here, as you can see, art by Polychrome. And that's an example of some of the monsters who are going to be in the book. Okay, and Hag was our other script winner for 2018. Um, that was written by Chad Stroop, who I believe is also here. <laughs> I guess sort of a classic horror story about a sea monster, except the main characters are Vietnam veterans and it takes place during a Texas flood. We got our uh, artist for a uh, previous American Gothic title, Finn, John Clark, to do the art for it, and he's wonderfully creepy and he's done a great job. All right. Thank you, Holly. Um, who likes horror comics? is Famous Monsters of Filmland's comic book imprint, and they do some amazing, amazing stuff. If you guys are here for 60 years, I know that you guys probably know this, but the good news is they don't just do horror comics. They also do other genres like crime, monster comics, and the, good, the, the coolest thing here is we got Monster World, which is written by Famous Monsters of Filmland's own publisher, Philip Kim, and it is a monster crime story set in the 30s. It is bar not incredible. It stars a detective named Barrymore who slowly but surely starts to figure out that monsters are indeed real. And he is a gumshoe trying to get to the bottom of a mystery. It is incredible. And it is all from this gentleman here's mind. Phil, say hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Now, the first couple issues, we're introduced to Detective Barrymore. We see this beautiful world of the 30s. He figures out that there's, there's something going on that we don't quite understand. It could be supernatural in nature. He doesn't want to believe that, but by the end, you better believe that he believes that. Phil, without giving a spoiler from volume one, it ends, it, it, it ends in, in some, some peril. Can you give us a teaser of what the volume two might be like? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, um, Hank Barrymore does not believe in monsters and ghosts, and then he um, he's revealed uh, the monsters are revealed to him. But in the midst of this, he ends up losing the love of his life. Um, who he finds out is a um, uh, five thousand year old Galgamesh witch. So he literally goes into uh, becoming basically a monster detective to find her, and so um, so his whole journey is to. Um, you know, take on all of these uh, kind of occult uh, mysteries and, and, and take on jobs that he just doesn't really want to handle because it's scary, it's, you know, deadly, but, um, you know, so it's kind of a love story too, so. Fans of this comic will know that the writing and the art, they mesh so well together and they really create this beautiful ambiance of dread, of nostalgia, and really of mystery. And the, the monsters, I mean, the monsters are just like a cherry on top of that. Uh, Phil, in this book, there are a lot of nods to classic horror, like the Universal Monsters, as well as the old, creepy EC horror stories and crime stories. Um, how, how did those help you create the feel of Monster World? Well, I, one of my favorite movies is Casablanca, and I just thought, what if a detective actually, you know, crossed paths with the Universal Monsters? So I tried to just create a story where we could enjoy both of the genres. I mean, it succeeded, and I, 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 would, I wouldn't push this if I didn't honestly feel it, but it was a great book. You guys got to check out Volume 1. You're selling it at 1314, Famous Monsters of the Film Land. Right, right. And it, it, it's definitely worth a pick up. There's a lot of good books I'd love to tell you to read, but that would probably be my favorite pick right now. But we have big news. Uh, in addition to monsters, horror, American Gothic Press has done something or is in the process of doing something which is part of the reason American Gothic Press was originally created, and that's multimedia collaboration. Uh, American, American Gothic Press wants to not only have great entertainment in the pages of your comics, but also on the screen. 
So they're starting to partner with other companies that will make TV shows of their books, and then American Gothic Press can make comic books from their TV shows. And the biggest one, they're coming out of the gate strong, is a new comic book called Nice. Uh, nice is a amazing crime story that American Gothic together that American Gothic has put together. Uh, it was originally developed at Echo Lake. Now Echo Lake is a film production and finance company. They've made about 30 different films, and they are partnering to help get Nice as a comic. Now it was originally developed at Echo Lake as a screenplay, but now it's going to be adapted as an original AGP comic. It is the greatest and the first of many examples of the collaboration between these two companies. And we're, really, we're really excited to, to bring this to you guys today. It is a super gritty crime drama set in Los Angeles. It has assassins. It has kick-ass characters. Uh, it's got some really good moody, overarching mystery involved. What about action, shooting, uh, all the good stuff? Come on. Cars. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really, it, and again, it really, really, really looks cool. Uh, let's we'll look at some of this stuff. So this is some of the characters that we have here. I'm not going to tell you the name. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's not a period piece like Monster World is, but it definitely has a real gritty realism. You know, I don't know how many people are here from L.A., but it feels Ooh. like an L.A. book. Mm -hmm. Did we really woo for L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> to some of the people who helped make this book possible today, but I, I feel almost like Los Angeles is a character in this book as well, and it's, it really it speaks to the overall um, the cohesion of the book and how well it flows. Uh, but we are lucky enough that we have a whole bunch of panelists here today who helped make this book possible. Uh, we have uh, Dag... 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 Say again. Dag... Dag... Daggett Walker, he is one of the writers. We have Joseph Edinger. Edinger. Edinger, he is another one of the writers. We have uh, Mark Renee, who is the interior artist. We have uh, Tula Lotte, she is the, the she is one, she's the regular cover artist. David Mack was at another panel right now. He was not able to make it here today, but he's the has a variant cover coming out. And we also have John Chalesky, who was uh, involved with the pilot, writing the actual, or producing the actual thing for a pilot. We're gonna talk to him and see what he has to do with the comic book today. Um, so let's see, let's do... Uh, so uh, I'll start with David and Joseph. Can we give, you, give, give us the quick pitch? Let people know what NICE is. What is our, the quick dive in so everybody knows what NICE is about? Yeah. First, though, thanks so much for, for having us, and thank you all for, for being here. It's so great to see you here. Um, three words, it's uh, douchebag, hipster, assassins. <laughs> so that, I think we were kind of inspired by like Chinatown for millennials. It was kind of the, the vibe, uh, and poking fun at Los Angeles, and you know, what a 25-year-old who mostly wants to have sex and drink would do if you were an assassin. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So, Dan, I'm going to start with you. It's a super unique crime thriller. And uh, what drew you to writing this type of story as opposed to like a guy in a cave or something like that? Well, I've lived in Los Angeles for a long time, and I, you're right, there is a character in, in the city. And, and I, you, if you live in Los Angeles long enough, you see all these nooks and crannies. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to put something here that's contemporary that shows how gritty parts of the city still are? Um, and from a personal standpoint, that the characters are really important to me, and in particular the main character, which is on the previous slide, the character named Kevin, uh, was based on a friend of mine who went from, uh, who, who was in the process during this time and started first began this of, of going from becoming a, realizing that he was a sociopath or borderline sociopath, and entering in the world of what it was, what is like to be human. And our character Kevin, who's a young guy who's an assassin, and essentially begins that way, starts to, through the journey of this whole story, starts to wonder, am I more human than I think I am? And so that, I mean, all the characters have that. You also see Hemina there who's a detective, and she's looking for her daughter. I mean, it's a lot of really complex, fun characters. And that's what that's what drew me more than anything. So my next question is for Joseph. What influences in your life made their way into my stuff? What influenced you in creating this kind of story? 
Uh, drinking. <laughs> no. Uh, I think like the Los Angeles thing, it was a big, big common point for us to draw from. A lot of it takes place in Koreatown, and, uh, up just inside LA, and I always really like noir as a genre, and grew up you know, with Chinatown, and loving that movie, and loving Tarantino, and the way that you can kind of manipulate it as a genre to be modern or part of a period. And uh, just having fun inside that universe with, like he said, the characters kind of started coming to life, and from there it kind of took on its own structure, its own world. It's awesome. Um, the next question I want to ask is for John Terleski. We have a few more questions for you guys, so we'll come back around. But John, when you, 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 you're a director, you're a producer, you acted in movies and TV, what about a project like Nice really appealed to you? Uh, well, like uh, Joseph was just saying, I, I was really, because of my acting background when I started out, I was an actor for 13 years. So the first thing that hits me when I read something is the characters. And they had created this, this bouquet of, of uh, uh, these incredibly cool characters that just felt really fresh and that I hadn't seen before. There was a Tarantino quality to the, to the humor and the banter that the guys have uh, in the very early scenes. And I was like, oh, this is really fun, but it has a very dark quality. And, and then as I, as I read, further into the script, it just had a lot of, I tend to like things that combine a lot of genres into one piece. Um, this has humor, this has action, this has a, a very dark uh, quality. It's very, like Joseph said, it's very timeless. Doesn't, doesn't, like, it's, it, it has a, it, it definitely feels millennial at times, but it, I don't know, there's just something about the atmospherics of it that feel timeless. So, so that appealed to me, and uh, uh, you know, it has, as I say, you know, it has violence and, and sex and all the things that make life worth living. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that 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 just leapt off the page for me. And the one really important thing, and it's like you said for uh, Phil Kim's Monster World, the, the the blending of the writing and the art really helped this book come alive. I mean. We've only seen some previews and read the script, but when you put those two things together, what we've seen is amazing. So as important as the writing is, the art, I think, is equally important. And we're lucky we have two artists who've worked on the book with us here. Uh, first, we have Mark Renee. Mark is the interior artist in the book. Hey, Mark. Woo! Hello, everyone. So, Mark, the, the script is super stylistic, and I was wondering, when you're drawing, uh, what are you thinking in regards of helping to create that noirish atmosphere that is, at least on paper, on the black and white, it's super prevalent, but in your work I can see it coming through. What are you thinking as you, as you, as you transfer that to the page? Drinking. <laughs> I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> Actually, uh, for me, it's, it, it's, it's really about the characters and the mood that they set with their interactions and um, even with the jovial nature of Kevin and his counterpart, sure. I'm not trying to reveal too much, um, there's this, there's this un underlying darkness that comes along with the way that they joke and interact. And so it really helps paint the mood and fills in a lot of information for me as an artist to go for in terms of like scene selection, how I want them portrayed, and um, it, that's a lot of credit to how the writers have laid it out. Excellent. You guys can see some examples of the art here. I mean, again, just like you show with Monster World, you can see the atmosphere. I mean, that, to me, that, that's, that's what arrested me first when I started looking through this, is the atmosphere. You can see, like, that's Los Angeles. You guys know that's Los Angeles. You guys know some, some bad dramas happening on the other page, too. That character's named The Masked Man, by the way. I just, I'll let, I'll let that spoiler go. <laughs> that guy's called The Masked Man. It, it's a great, it, that, it's a great, I don't know, I can't spoil it. It's great. Uh, the interior art is beautiful, but also the covers are amazing. Um, I'm going to zip through this too fast. Yeah, this is to, again. I want to point this out real quick. If you look at the cool way they use different kind of panels, I mean, most panels just square, square, square. But look in the, in the headlights of the car. That's really cool. I have to admit, that's really, really cool. That was good. And I guess, throw it to the writers and, and, and Mark right now. Something like this page right now, in a script at least that I read, it was just a script script. Whose idea was it to come up with the, 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 you know, telling the story that way as far as panel things? I would say, I'm not going to take full credit for it because I've 
I dialogue with Holly and George, my editors, a lot about what we're trying to create here. And that page was actually born from uh, us identifying the car itself as the character in the script. And so once that was implanted in my brain, I'm like, well, let's have this the car tell the story at times too. And so you will see um, our dope ass GTO telling the story uh, quite often in the in the script, I mean, in the pages, so. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing that you guys can see it for yourself. Um, the covers are awesome as well. So this is, Mark, this is one of your covers, right? Yes. So those are the inks, and that's for issue number one. I'm not gonna tell you who's on there. You're gonna have to read the book and find out. Now this is a variant cover that we have by the wonderful Tula Lote. <laughs> You know uh, Miss Latte in her own right. You know her from her other colors, and I feel like I could talk to you all day about all that. But I was told specifically to talk to you about these. Uh, let me ask you: When you're a cover artist, as opposed to the ongoing artist like Mark is, what's your process for interpreting the characters and the setting? Are you influenced by Mark's work, by something different, or do you kind of come into it with your own your own ideas? Yeah, um, the interiors are always really important. Mark, it, it helps when you've got an amazing interior artist like Mark. Um, so you can get a lot of inspiration from that. Sometimes when I'm looking to do a cover, I might be so inspired by interior panels that I decide to lift one straight out of that for the cover and do my own interpretation of it. Or sometimes it's just the feel of the character. Um, Holly sent a great email through um, Kind of talking my language about the kind of films that this comic was relating to um, Tarantino, Drive, the Nicholas Winden reading stuff. It's, it's all stuff that I really, really love, so I was incredibly inspired by that. Um, so when, when I'm creating a cover, it's always about the character, as Mark was saying, um, the expressions of people and tone, um, whether it's dark, moody, um, light hearted. All of those things are important, and um, the way I use colours usually incorporates that. So I wanted to have a much darker feel with this cover and kind of show the great violence that's going on and the kind of cool hipster vibe that, that we've got sure. going on the story. So that, that was my thinking behind it. And again, you guys can see the proof up there, and the colours of the actual comic are even more beautiful, just the overall. It's that meshing of the, the characters, the writing, and then of course, we're talking about how Los Angeles is a character, the car is a character. And I mean, look at that cover and tell me that not everything on that page is super important. And wait till you read the story. Um, as far as importance goes, everyone keeps mentioning Holly. Holly, you are the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. What do you do for the comic book magazine? Um, I'm a general editor for all of the comic book titles that American Gothic Press puts out. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, actually, when we first got the uh, the script, the pilot script, um, I, we weren't sure if, if we were we, we were going to adapt that into a comic book, or if someone else was, if we were going to hire someone else. And uh, we talked to these guys, to Daggett and Joseph, and they said they wanted to take it on. And they were like, yeah, we want to do it. And we were like, okay, I mean, have you guys ever written a comic book before? And the answer was no. So we, you know, we, we, we sent them a bunch of uh, script ideas. And they just came back with, with, with this incredible comic book script, and I couldn't believe it was the first one they'd ever written. So they just knocked it out of the park. I had to do very little. <laughs> well, that leads into my next question. Uh, Dagan, you, you've written and directed films for Paramount and Sci-Fi. How is writing for a feature film different compared to writing for a comic book like this? Yeah, you know, it's... Uh, the writing directing thing is an interesting thing because the amazing thing about writing the comic book is that you write, you know, the adaptation was hard and Holly is being very generous. She was so, so helpful in this process and we're so grateful for her and famous monster for letting us have a chance at this. But the thing about writing and directing is you write and then you have to put the visuals on the day, you know, storyboards or whatever. And so the thing about comic books is, is that those two skills worked out for Joseph and I who also works in this this field is you write it, and then you actually just have to write what you're seeing. 
And so um, for me, it, was, uh, it took a lot of discipline. And one of the things you learn as writer directors is you can write something and cheat, and no one will know until you're on set. <laughs> and, then, and then you actually, if you're the writer director, you, you're punished for the cheat that you made. And in this case, you can't cheat with comic books because it's right there on the page. Everyone's going to see it. We have amazing artists, and if they don't understand, they'll be like, oh, they'll be like, oh, this doesn't make sense. So it was it was a very different process, but lovely to work with these people. That's awesome. That's a cool way to think of it. Real quick for. for and Joseph, do you guys live in LA? Yes. Have you lived in LA for a long time? Long enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, long enough to get a cover. Okay. Yes. Uh, back to Mark. Mark, as you're drawing from their scripts, are there any other movies or television, any other images in your head that you're thinking of as you start to create the world next? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I go through. I don't know how many films a year, just I, I love watching films, especially like horror and crime drama. And I draw inspiration from things like, like even say Drive, uh, um, Leon the Professional, like any fans of that movie out there? And you, you can't really just rely on one movie or one title to really get the inspiration you need for these characters and these settings. And so um, I, I've been blessed with curiosity of all sorts. And so I, I really draw from just everything that I take in, not just in the media, but also in real life, people that I've run into. Uh, it's very interesting that Kevin was born from a friend of the writers because there is a Kevin, an actual Kevin in my life who is exactly like the Kevin in the comic books. <laughs> Hey, dude, can I talk to you on the phone? <laughs> yeah, it's like, dude, can I talk to you on the phone? And he's like, no, I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm doing hipster stuff. Like, I'm too cool for you. I'm like, dude, you work at like your receptionist. Like, you, you answer calls all day. Just answer my call. So, there's there's elements of like just people I know in my life that really lend to these characters as well, and it gives a it, it gives a richness to it, which makes it really fun working with the, the characters. That's awesome. And like I said, I mentioned before, David Matt uh, is a another variant cover artist. Uh, he was not able to make it here, but this is the cover sketch that he did as a prelim, so look for his free, uh, his, his uh, variant covers as well. So I have another question for Joseph. Uh, you've worked in editorial and in the post-production in a lot of TV shows and movies. What got you out of that and into, I mean, I know you still do it, but what got you into the comic book writing? No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, I mean, I've always uh, been writing. Kid. Grew up with X Men and like humming the theme song to the X Men cartoon around the house until my brother got mad enough to you know, hit me. Uh, but I, I've always really liked comic books. I've continued to read comic books, and it honestly kind of surprised both of us that uh, they approached us about turning this into a comic book. We were really excited by that. And John, actually, when he first read the pilot, had mentioned, like, this sounds kind of like a comic book. So it felt, uh, it felt like a style that I had been kind of grifting for a long time, and it was an opportunity to actually write one, and I hopped on it. It was amazing. That's, that's awesome. And I mean, since you mentioned John, uh, John, you, you directed two pilots recently and created the book of shows from the script. When you're looking at a comic book like this, what, what, do, you, what do you see in your head? When you make something like this, can you see the show that you're trying to make? Yeah, I mean, I, I see images. Thank you. It's all of a sudden, it's there. Um, I do see images. You know, it, it, it's just a part of the process. You know, you, you start to visualize, and I think when you know one of the measures of if I'm reading the script, if I'm shooting it in my head while I'm reading it, which is a good sign. Good. So, so that very much was happening from the beginning. There's a fantastic. Within the first five minutes of this of their script, I was immediately in because there's a sequence that I don't want to do any spoilers, but uh, it's just one of the most visually stunning and promising sequences that I've, I've read in anything, and I was like, I'd just love to get my teeth into that. Um, it's a fantastic sequence, and it really hooks the the reader or the viewer. Um, but I, I think I think you know, in terms of um, uh, you know, Mark's going to have, uh, uh, you know, images are going to come to him and he's got page design to be concerned about. He's got, 
Um, you know, there's still frames. I'm going to have different locations. Everything's going to be di dictated by various circumstances. But I think the I think the most interesting example is the 300, where where you take you take Frank Miller. They took I, I think Zack Snyder took images from the comic that because I've had I've had that for a while before, and I, I I mean who can forget the one with the wolf at the beginning looking over? Uh, you know he took those and was inspired them and 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 worked them into the into the film. Uh, but it wasn't like he did it wasn't like he used the comic as absolute biblical storyboards, right. but there were great images that were incorporated into the movie that I think are iconic and, and work both in the, in, the, in the visual on the page and work in the visual on the screen. And they're, just so, they're just such powerful uh, images, whether they're 2D or, or you know, 2D drawn or, or film. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping to steal as much stuff of yours as I possibly can. <laughs> And it's, it's important, John's talking about yeah, images. Tula, you have, in my opinion, one of the more difficult jobs as the cover artist because a lot of times that is the first impression, so to speak, that someone might have that they see of a book, right? Someone who's not at this panel might see it in a comic book store, and no pressure, but they might look at your art and figure out are they gonna pick that book up or not. Is that something that you think about as you're drawing? No. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's kind of, for me, I, I can't because I just freak out and not draw anything. Um, I think really when I'm approaching a cover, I need to just get a feel for it, a feel for the story, look at the great interior art, and, and really from that draw from, for myself, um, draw, draw what I want to see on there and just do the best job I can. Um, and try and forget the fact that it's um, going to be the thing that's selling the book and um, all the pressure that comes along with it. I, I think you're doing a good job. You don't need to worry about it. Look, I mean, look at that, right? <laughs> now let me ask you guys, would you guys like to talk to some monster creators, some assassin creators, some beautiful noir thriller artists? Yes? <laughs> We're gonna open up to a Q&A right now. So I wanna do a couple things. One thing I wanna remind you guys, if you can, uh, we have a microphone in the middle. Uh, you can come up and line up at the microphone if you have questions for any of our panelists. Please say it nice and loud. Please remember that a question ends with a question mark. <laughs> Go for it, man. Uh, awesome. Um, thank you for coming out, you guys. I really appreciate this. So I think it was either last year or the year before, the remake of Mummy came out with Tom Cruise. And it, I don't know, maybe some people like this, some people didn't, but critically it didn't really receive high, um, high reviews. But this is supposed to be like the part of the new, I guess like cinematic universe for monster films. They want to keep it going like the Marvel Cinematic Universe or anything like that. So I guess my question for you guys is, what do you, um, going, like, going forward, how would you like to see the universe like unravel? Like what would you like? Anything like that. What type of monsters would you like to see? How they do it exactly? Anything? Anyway, I guess I'll take that one. Uh, I think uh, it's really important to focus on each individual film and not the universe as a whole, because that's what get, that's what's going to make people care about the universe. You know, if they if they if they see the movies that lead up to it and they don't care, then they're not going to care if you know whatever character comes on the screen in, in another film. You know, it's 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 a, you have to look at each individual part. I think more than anything. Perfect. Thank you so much. What was your guys' favorite war films growing up? Say again. What was your guys' favorite war films growing up? Or your favorite war films? Oh man, we're gonna be here. You guys got nothing to do, right? <laughs> Favorite horror film? The Ring scared the shit out of me when I was on one of my first dates in high school. I was very embarrassed, but it left a scar. Hellraiser. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Carnival of Lost Souls. Ooh, way back. Hellraiser got me as well. Um, for, for me, I'm a big horror fan, I love it. Um, yeah. But um, for, for me growing up, I really loved some of the old black and white ones, The Innocents, The Haunting, like Night of the Demon. Oh. 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 Oh.
did we not hear from you? Is anyone else want to jump in there? Back here on Elm Street. Invasion of the Body Snatchers, actually, the 70s remake with Donald Sutherland. Oh. Uh, I'll jump in there with the original Psycho. Psycho from Evan. Always. So does anybody else have, have a question? Or we can help pass this around so we don't have to crawl over people. Oh, you have one. There you go. Yes, you can, sir. Thank you. Go for it, man. Hello. Um, I'm a big fan of the Universal Monsters from the 30s. And I was just wondering, like, with you experts up there, do you have any sleeper films that I can put into my next my Netflix queue? You guys think? I have one. Do it. <laughs> one that I actually saw about a little over a decade ago. It's a little indie you know, totally unknown horror film that I saw. It's called Head Trauma. Um, it's, uh, I had never heard of it, but I read the back and I was like, this sounds creepy and awesome. And it's, in fact, it has a lot, of, a lot in common with the very first uh, Ring movie in a lot of ways. Um, but it's very low budget, but it, 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 watch it in the dark, it will, it will scare you. I don't know if it's on Netflix, but I have to recommend The Deadly Spawn. It's a weird yeah. little indie oh, movie. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, low budget, but man, they did it right. So I don't know if it's on Netflix, but if you can find it. Does anybody, else have a, what, anybody else have a question? I'll, I'll pass it to you so you don't have to climb over anybody. Well, I, uh, I just want to talk, say, I just, got more movies. I just really saw, I just recently saw a movie called Bright. It didn't get great reviews, but it was an amazing concept. Has anybody else seen Bright? Yeah. I mean, what, what great makeup, right? I mean, it was just fantastic, yeah. I, I think they're making a second one. The best and the handsomest? Well, do you know anybody that works on that movie role? Everyone? Like all the studios? All the ADI? Oh, really? Oh. Wow. So that is the best of the best. So if you guys didn't hear that answer, it's ADI, which is uh, Amalgamated Dynamics, which is a special effects uh, company. Who else? Uh, Spectre Motion worked on it. Also, Mortal Mask did all the background masks for the movie. These are like the elite of special effects. Yeah. So if you haven't seen it, that means that you're in for a uh, practical special effects. It's definitely a fantastic practical movie. You get to see the best of application and makeup and movement. And, uh, it, it's, it, in a world of CGI monsters and big giant black holes in the sky, it's it's a it's really nice change up. Yeah, what's interesting about that movie is I didn't like as far as LA was concerned, it didn't feel like it's out of place. You know what I mean? It was, <laughs> Do we have another question on here? Go for it. So I was curious. What would you say would be your favorite film or book that's a psychological thriller, horror story, more so than blood and guts and stuff? Night of the Hunter, 1954, if you guys have ever seen that. I can't think of a scarier movie without pitching it too hard. It's Robert Meacham who plays a killer priest with a secret agenda, and it involves scaring the shit out of a bunch of children. <laughs> and like he terrifies these kids, and I've never been more emotionally attached to a character in a horror. And I don't even think it's a horror movie. We'll call it a thriller. It's but it's the scariest movie I've ever seen because he just menaces these children, not in a physical way, but you're scared for them the whole two hours. It's, I mean, I don't know. Frailty for me. Oh. Uh, House of Leaves. Some people have probably read that, but it's a. a existential nightmare book and it's haunting and, and hard to put down. It's really excellent. The Exorcist is, is still the hands down scariest movie I've ever seen in my life. A little movie called Soul Survivor. Has anyone ever seen it? It's a direct to DVD 1982. No? Okay. <laughs> and then um, anybody see Changeling? Yeah. 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 Was... And we're talking about a lot of horror stuff. You guys know that October is the month of horror, but it's also the month of art releases. So the annual comes out in October, as well as Nice is going to hit shelves in October. Yeah. December. December. <laughs> Another scary month. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have one more? One more question? One more quick one. This gentleman here, one more question. Um, first off, I used to buy your magazine back in the 70s when I was a kid, so I know it's been around for a long time. Um, the, my question is, is, have any of you ever used like a significant event or personality 
um, to come up with an idea which actually led to um, introducing it into either a script or a comic or a story. A personal experience. I can, I can say just for the, for the, for nice, the character of Kevin is based on this guy, mostly. So. <laughs> Just, just think about that when you read it. <laughs> you deal with this guy, you know? The car actually is uh, influenced by another show that I deeply love. Um, anybody familiar with Baby from Supernatural? Woo! Yeah, so I wanted to give it that type of life. Uh, it's like that show, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm hardcore fan of it. I'm like fanboy, like to BT. And uh, yeah, it, that, I, that is, I guess, a significant life experience for me because that show is <laughs> like, I, it's like in my upper echelon of like TV shows. And so the, the car was definitely influenced. It's Baby's Baby. <laughs> well, guys, that is just about all the time we have. So give it up for our panelists, guys.